Hello and welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects and startups driving decentralization and the global blockchain revolution. My name is Brian Fabian Crane. And I'm Meher Roy. Today we are talking to Andrew Trask of Open Mind. Open Mind is a very interesting project that uses tools from cryptography and blockchains in order to create decentralized AI that can use private data from different people around the world to train AI models without compromising the privacy of the people contributing the data. Andrew, welcome to the show. Thanks, great to be here. So um, before we start, tell us a bit about your background and how you came to create Open Mind. Yeah, um, so before I uh, moved here, I'm a PhD student at the University of Oxford. Um, and before I was a PhD student, I worked for a really exciting company based in, in the US called Digital Reasoning. Um, and uh, they, they, they specialized in on-prem uh, enterprise uh, deep learning and AI services, uh, and they still do. Um, and, and one of the things I came to really appreciate then was, was how difficult it was to get access to private data. Uh, and so um, during my time here as a PhD, um, I, I got really involved in AI safety conversations. Um, and, and really how, how OpenMind got started was a blog post uh, looking for, for the right tools to build safe AI and to try to contribute to that conversation. That's how I came across uh, multi-party computation, homomorphic encryption, uh, and there's a kind of a blog post out from last, last March. Um, and then we opened up the GitHub repositories in, um, in, I guess, July of last year. And uh, we've been writing code ever since. So. <laughs> So tell us, like, why why is cryptography, like homomorphic encryption and multi-party computation, relevant to safe AI and AI in general? Um, yeah, it, it, that's actually a great question. Um, and and for I think most of uh, most of their existence, the, the the conversation around AI and machine learning and and these cryptography tools have sort of lived in isolation. Uh, I mean, there's been a handful of workshops at like uh, NIPS or ICML. Um, where there'll be a, a few papers that discuss private machine learning, but it's it's still a really small, um, uh, really small field, um, but but growing quickly. Um, but the, the reason that it's important is that that cryptography is all about protecting really valuable digital assets, right? Uh, and and also limiting the use of, of of various digital assets. So in in the this most simple case with just uh, asymmetric encryption, I have a data file, I want to be able to put it somewhere, and I want only me to be able to do stuff with it and only me to be able to access it. Um, but in the context of machine learning, often you want to have something that's a little bit more nuanced. You want to have the ability to just do training or just do prediction. Um, or you only want to be able to do prediction if a lot of people are participating. Or you have some sort of digital asset that you want to interact with, um, but you don't want to be able to interact with in arbitrary ways. And and that's where where the conversation between kind of cryptography and machine learning really gets started. Um, so the private kind of private machine learning as a field is all about either um, I need to put a model in a place where people might try to steal it, um, or I have data that I need to learn things about without actually having a copy of. Um, and so the, the 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 blog post that really kicked off uh, OpenMind was was talking about homomorphically encrypted models, where I can take a model that's fully encrypted, and I can give it to you, and you can make it smarter, but you don't have the ability to predict with it. Um, and so it's it's sort of like a one way gate for sort of intelligence, right? And and there there are various um, there are various long standing problems in this field. So the biggest one being efficiency, um, um, but but that's sort of what the conversation is all about, right? I want to have limited ability um, so that the people who are participating uh, in AI machine learning are protected in various ways. So you mentioned briefly uh, AI safety. Now, I, I'm sort of familiar with, with what that is. Probably many people are, but for those who aren't and aren't so deep into machine learning, can you define what that is? Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna do the, do the best that I can. I, I would not call myself uh, primarily an AI safety researcher. So so uh, if if any of the folks that I know that are, are real AI safety researchers, uh, uh, they might they might correct me on this. But um, um, AI safety uh, really deals with, in particularly AGI safety, um, deals with the problem of how how do we as individuals with 
if we're lucky, IQ of 150, uh, uh, limit the abilities and the, the values and the, and the goals of something with an IQ of 15,000. Um, and it, that, that's actually, um, it's, it's closely related with a lot of concepts, funny enough, in political science, um, where you have, you know, a large group of, of a population and you're trying to make it so that these few people at the top that have control of a lot of resources act in the interest of, of the population. Um, and so that's kind of, a, most of the AI safety conversation is around that. We're, we're very close to the AI safety in that, that we, we, we try to innovate on like the tools that you would use to do that. Um, I think that the most precise term for what we work on is probably AI security. Um, and to the extent that we're trying to build really good boxes and really good tools that that allow you to do different things uh, and, and kind of give the AI safety community more knobs that they can turn, right? So, so um, in the case of narrow AI, one of those knobs that, that we're trying to bring online into the into general knowledge and, and, and ease, ease of use is the ability to train machine learning models on data that you can't see uh, and train machine learning models on data you don't have access to. And that's like, that's a really good example of us building a new tool that is then valuable for the AI safety community in the narrow AI space. Um, and obviously we'd like to keep going into the, the general AI safety uh, space as well. Yeah, maybe, maybe we can come back to that in a, in a second, but I, I just sort of would like to understand this big picture. Now, I, you know, we kind of started talking immediately about this idea of how open mind a little bit approaches these things, but maybe to give a bit more context as well, there's a lot of news these days, right? A lot of kind of discussion and discourse around yeah. the issue that, you know, a few companies like Google, Facebook, Amazon ha are acquiring like huge amounts of data. Uh, and acquiring a huge amount of power, right? We also see political backlash against this and with, uh, in Europe, for example, with things like this right to be forgotten or like data protection laws and stuff like that. So what do you see at kind of as the current state, like where the trajectory is and, and how does that fit into uh, open mind? Where the rubber really meets the road, um... It's, it's a big hairy issue. There's a lot of players involved. There's, there's a lot of, of, of kind of conflicting ideas and, and, and probably the biggest theme of 2017 is regulators really getting their hands, getting their hands around it. Um, um, there was, there was big, big research interests from, I know U S Congress and, and parliament, uh, here, here in the UK, uh, as well as the European, uh, European parliament, obviously with GDPR. Um, I, I think that the, the, the way that I see it, the general theme is that a new asset came into the marketplace, right? Data, and and, and with with tools like for for big data becoming widely accessible, companies started collecting it, and and this went largely unregulated, like all new tools. Um, and now we're starting to learn a little bit about the externalities of of how it should be protected. You know, governments tend to be a little bit more responsive than than or and reactive than than proactive. So I think what we've seen is that this incredibly valuable asset has been aggregated. Um, as you know, sort of like maybe oil was when it was first, you know, back in the, I guess it would be the, you know, around like Andrew, Andrew Carnegie oil and steel and like all those, these kinds of things, like when they really came online, um, and, and we're sort of rounding the corner just like they did back then to, to, to significantly more, more regulation. Now, as far as where open mind fits in with that, um, I I've watched many of these regulatory talks and the, the one tragic thing is that, uh, no one seems to be aware like from like none of the regulators seem to be aware of the notion that you can train models without having access to data. Like the conversation almost always boils down to, well, we have this trade-off between innovation and between privacy. How 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 do we know how much privacy to give up and innovation to receive? And and just even the existence of these these tools is just it's it's almost like it's totally it's just not reaching the public discourse. Um, and so a, a huge part of what we're trying to do in in the Open Mind Project is just almost let people know that this field private machine learning exists, that, that many of the tools are, are ready for practical use. Um, and we're building software to make that as, as accessible as possible. So in the short run, if, if we're very successful as a community, um, you know, that, that discourse will change because people will actually realize that you don't have this nasty trade-off between privacy and innovation, um, with, with kind of these new pieces of technology. Okay. No, that, that's, I think that's very helpful. And, uh, makes sense now maybe kind of one last thing on that i don't fully can you elaborate a little bit on the 
connection between private AI and AI safety? Because you know, we, we, we explained right why uh, multi-party computation and and these things obviously have implications for how AI works today and this centralization mm -hmm. of data and power. But what, how does that relate to safe AI? Um, so the real difference between those two things is is narrow AI versus general AI. So so. AI safety is mostly concerned with general AI, meaning they're concerned with something having an exorbitantly high IQ that that you know threatens humanity, right? Uh, but the, the 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 privacy conversation is mostly about narrow AI. So it's about you know the, these the things that that industry uh, has optimized uh, optimized certain business use cases for um, that leverage private data um, and that may or may not be also defending the interests of the people who own the. That, that private data, right? Um, or, or, so, so they they are slightly different, but the 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 overlap is primarily in 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 the tools that are involved, because the tools that you use to to mitigate the trade offs in 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 narrow AI, um, we hope will have broad implications as the conversation around AI safety for general AI unfolds, because. Um, it's also a matter of like what's tractable now and what's what's what sort of we expect to be important in AGI in the future. Yeah, uh, maybe one one thought on that. I mean, I I don't know much about AI, but when I was reading maybe some sort of science fiction novel where like AI takes <laughs> over the world and stuff, mm -hmm. um, it seemed pretty obvious to me how blockchain could play a huge role in that. In that you could have maybe some kind of uh, you know, reputation system managed on a chain, right? Where there could be some kind of, you know, way to turn off access for these AIs or like some kind of economic management layer, right? That kind of controls AI and puts some sort of governance over where I, do you see that also as a direction in the long term to handle this, uh, AI safety problem? Um, yes, but, but maybe not in the way that, um, Maybe not in the way that is most obvious uh, from science fiction literature. Um, the The thing that blockchain brings to the table um, in terms of governance is not really any new. There's nothing new on like the theoretical governance side, right? Like it's still you still have the same problems with with value alignment. Like how do you get these super smart things to have the same the same values as us? Which is the same as saying how do we have our political leaders have the same values as us? And so so even for the the normal kind of political alignment. Um, uh, conversation. It's not like it, there there aren't new themes. What what blockchain really brings is potentially is is tremendous amounts of liquidity and transparency to that conversation. So so whereas right now we 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 vote on basically everything for the whole year with this one very discreet event, right? Which is when we vote for one political leader to take power. And and um, you could think of you know there could be scenarios in the future for AGI where where you know, you, you could have very discretized events for for how you how you make your say and try to have the, the AI to be aligned to your own values. The really nice thing about blockchain is that you can make that a lot more nuanced, right? Like because you can do lots of transactions really, really quickly. Um, so so particularly with, with AGI, what I'm what I'm really excited about is is the ability that that um, instead of saying instead of saying, Oh, this AGI did something bad, let's um, let's pass a bill and like turn it off, right? Um, you could say, hey, um, this AGI is is behaving, um, you know, its its value is misaligned a little bit in this direction. Let's let's curb the resources on that side and give it a little bit more reward on this side, and 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 sort of direct it towards towards where we want it to go, right? So when I say increase liquidity, I mean increase nuance in the way that we can interact with the with the two main resources that it lives on, right? Which is compute and data. Um, and and so that's that's kind of why I'm most excited uh, <laughs> uh, about about blockchain participating in, in in the AI safety conversation. It's it it gives us much more fine grained control over uh, in, in theory uh, than than traditional kind of governance structures based on uh, sort of hierarchical voting schemes do. Um, and and I think that's that's net new. That's very interesting and. Uh, and obviously, the the interplay with with blockchain being accessible to consumers to be able to participate is also extremely extremely exciting. So, um, from AGI, let's sort of return to narrow AI and um, <laughs> and open mind. So, open mind is one of the first, I think, one of the first systems that um, that uses like blockchain and uh, 
in order to do something interesting in order to deliver a capability that is that is new the way i understand it is um generally with with traditional ai and machine learning um the way the industry works is there's a company in the center that collects data from a lot of diff- lot of users it creates a huge data set and then this data set is used to train models inside the company and once the model is trained um it creates some kind of application or or api that others can access and it monetizes basically the access to that to that model in some way now open mind is about flipping this architecture and uh, tell us tell us how tell us like what open mind would allow and how would how would models be built on open mind and monetized on open mind that that was that was a brilliantly um articulated kind of description of of sort of how the machine learning industry works works right now um and, and we 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 do live in a world where this is this is kind of the structurally like all of our machine learning and ai tools assume that you've collected all the data into one place so there's this kind of not another option right and and even from a business model standpoint the machine learning business model is dependent on this idea because that's how all the resources and all the tools and all the kind of almost even just the ideas in the vc's heads kind of kind of sit um and um the story for how open mind participates in this really starts with um how much tools can define what people actually spend their time doing cuz cuz ultimately what we are is we're we're a community and we're a a set of open source tools right and and so what we would like to see is people pick up tools like federated learning um and and really change change that dynamic so so federated learning in particular right this is a this is a piece of technology that was developed internally at at Microsoft and Google um to to allow you to train machine learning models on data that's not centralized and they originally started working on this uh, in the context of smartphones so so from a from a networking standpoint you didn't want to actually have to pull data from smartphones to be able to update update the model that like recommends the next word for for when you're texting um and and so what we would like to do is be able to make that that kind of federated learning technology widely accessible right so that instead of if i want to train a machine learning model um uh, right now i would go to you know a vc who and say hey i think that i can train a model on fitbit data uh and that that will use your heart rate to predict um you know how well you're going to sleep that night or some other lifestyle some other lifestyle goal you're trying to optimize for um then you would then you once you convince that vc they'd write a big check you would buy the data you would you would you would kind of clean it train your model and then sell sell the use of that application and this is all contingent on whether or not you can convince the vc that this is this model is going to make money you can kind of forget the idea of doing it for just social good right um uh where open mind changes that story is if if we execute on the vision that we've laid out um instead of going to a vc and going through this whole rigmarole without even like getting out of your pajamas you'll just walk over to your laptop sit down and open up you know your your jupyter notebook and and train a model on private data um that it will be readily accessible that there will be no no privacy kind of trade off um as an externality um and that kind of your everyday person everyday machine learning developer will have access um to to these kinds of data sets um and not just for commercial use um but also for just building a model for social good uh and that's you know the the name open mind is really inspired by open open source um to the extent that the open source community took something that was almost all like that that w- was built in in industry and only used for kind of making money um and instead allowed large groups of individuals to collaborate on it in such a way that you can also spend time doing things for social good um and in in the machine learning space that means access to compute and access to data uh with tools like federated learning so so that effectively means that if um if you're the engineer building the model for fitbit data so let's assume that these fitbit devices they collect heart rates and sleep patterns so you are the engineer building the model and i am a user of this fitbit and my fitbit collects my data then you can essentially create a model and i can i can help train your model with my data in such a way that my data always stays with me and never needs to be shipped to you correct so you get a better model and i get compensated in some form uh for the service of training your model exactly and there's no privacy implication for me 
so yes there are always privacy implications like 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 from a cryptographic security standpoint you know like there's there's there was a new vulnerability against every almost every operating system on the planet that came out three days ago but barring barring events like that um that the system is designed to mitigate the need for machine learning um engineers to actually see the data points that they're training um and that's 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 net new and, and making that accessible has really really nice externalities like this this kind of seems amazing from a you know from a crypto mindset right like so like crypto people are generally very very pri privacy conscious and uh, we have people in our community that like don't participate in facebook um don't have like twitter accounts um mm -hmm. that that probably like you know like encrypt all of their communications they they send out they're very wary of these uh, large companies collecting all that data and uh, somehow somehow there's an unspoken challenge that if the whole world were to be paranoid about data like that we just wouldn't build any good machine learning models right uh, so <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so as as the crypto community we want to make the whole world paranoid about their data but then in the current current sort of framework of how things happen if we do succeed as the crypto community then uh, machine learning in today's paradigm might have a hard time so in in some sense is like open mind is this is sort of the solution or something in the direction towards the solution where um the the crypto community fantasy can also be satisfied while also the ai community being able to build the models that we need in order to basically upgrade our our civilization right? yeah absolutely absolutely and 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 really the the best part is that like those those tools have been invented that's that's like that's sort of the good news right the, the good news is that it's it's not like this is some mysterious hocus pocus thing in the future these things exist like there are there are there are conferences that have been publishing about them for for years and as as computation has gotten faster there there are many of them that are ready for prime time we're just not using them like people people don't know that 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 trade off is a false choice um and that's that's like the real tragedy um and and hopefully we can we can mitigate that so yeah i'm i'm super excited about that there's always like a discussion centered around principles like we as the crypto community like in principle don't like the idea of big corporates collecting all our data but then uh, like capitalism has its own rhythm right like so so new technology or a new system will be adopted because um it enables new ways of making money that weren't possible before like that's the logic of capitalism right like principles be damn show us a way to make money can i quote I, you on that like uh speaking for the voice of capitalism <laughs> yeah <laughs> definitely <laughs> definitely so um so so uh, like 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 let's assume like yeah this is possible that you can like train train models to do various things without compromising the privacy of data what kind of applications do you think will be enabled by it that just aren't there today and with which people oh can, man you know, come companies can make money this is my favorite question um there are there are so many amazing things that we could be building um if there wasn't this private like privacy trade-off right i mean you, you, the, the first one that always comes to mind for me is is um private data protects the things in our lives that are personal right things that are personal and things that we tend to try to hide are also some of our greatest pain points and some of our greatest weaknesses and some of our greatest vulnerabilities right and and so when you open up the potential for people to to innovate in that space without the privacy trade off the kinds of products and services that you could that you could build without the threat that it actually you know that that it takes advantage of the people that are participating right like like the the types of products and services that that become possible to build are are astounding and they they give me goosebumps whenever i talk about them like like if you wanted to train a machine learning model that was going to help predict when someone was going to have some sort of mental disorder or breakdown or or depression or the extreme versions of depression like self harm like the, these are the things that they no one tells anyone right and and being able to to help predict that in advance and intervene um and not intervene like not intervene in a bad way i mean intervene is in like like reach out and be like hey are you okay right I, uh, um 
or, or for people to even know themselves like hey you're 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 walking down a road that's likely going to lead to 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 self-harm or, or or to despair like if you wanted to try to predict that ahead of time and and give someone an app that's like hey predict when you're you're headed to a bad place you would need to have access to unbelievably private data right underneath the current scheme like like in order for a company to aggregate that, it would be insane. Like you would never ever want to trust a company to aggregate that detailed of a of amount of information. But like that's like that's like, you know, home transcripts or something. Like it's like ooky spooky stuff, right? But if instead, with federated learning, you're taking the machine learning model to that person and you're letting them train it, right? Um, and, you, and you don't have this privacy trade off. It, it could be possible for us as a community to work together to train models that actually help help predict and mitigate and trade off some of these. Some of the most private and personal aspects of our life, right? That that's the hope. That's the whole thing, right? We're, we're severely limited in our ability to help people with their most personal and most intimate problems because we don't know how to do it, or we seem to not know how to do it without aggregating data and and and, and putting those people, the very people we're trying to help, at risk. And and the tech open mind is about is about getting rid of that and 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 showing another way. Cool, that's very uh, articulate and good, and clearly you're passionate about this point. Uh, and I, I, want it, I want to understand one aspect here better. So I, I, that argument makes sense to me, right? So I have a bunch of private data. I, I mean, I would like to learn more, maybe have it be used in some way, and, and now it may be possible to do that, or it will be possible to do that for something like Open Mind. But if you look at this overall kind of transformation of how the industry works that you know Maher and you kind of described right where we have this shift from data and algorithm in a silo controlled by a huge company to you know data being kind of co commonly available but encrypted algorithms being improved on this almost like public good so I, I, I see that one driver could be individuals saying, oh, privacy, my privacy is better protected in that world. But do you think there are like big economic drivers that are also pushing in that direction? Or do you, is, is it kind of a conflict, right, where the economic driver is more <laughs> like reinforcing the centralized world and we have a privacy uh, kind of need going in the other direction? Or can you ex see how you see these forces playing out against each other or, or supporting each other? This is where open mind becomes real and becomes something more than just, hey, wouldn't it be nice? Um, because in this particular configuration, um, it is more efficient, less costly to do the same thing that aggregating data does. And, and here's, here's why I mean that. If you have an organization, an entity, anything that has to act as a middleman in the creation of value, Right, like so. So data is extracted. You can think of that like being oil pulled from the ground, right? And then you have this middleman that cleans it and curates it and gets it ready for production, right? And then then it gets gets distributed. Um, federated learning, from a tech standpoint, um, eliminates the the need for a, a middleman by allowing machine learning specialists and and data owners to interact directly. Um, so from an economic standpoint. Uh, I mean, depending on how, like, I guess the computation shakes out, that's just more efficient. Data and machine learning uh, practitioners together can create a certain amount of value. Um, and right now they're doing it with, with the middleman. If, if you offer a technological ability to, to, to not do that, you have a bigger margin. And if you have a bigger margin, it means you can either undercut on cost or, or grow faster. Um, now, we as OpenMind are not, um, we're not like, we're not a company. We're not even a nonprofit. We're a community that's trying to make these tools as accessible as possible. Like this is a movement that's going to happen, um, and we're just trying to be there to help facilitate it um, and, and to make these tools as accessible as possible because we believe in the social consequences of of this movement. Um, and yeah, like like t ten to twenty years from now, I hope that people refer to Open Mind like they do open source, um, to the extent that it's a classification of tools. That, that allow for the shared training and ownership of, of models based on, you know, distributed private assets being data. Yeah, I mean, I mean, one thing I can also see is just the aspect of having this very fine grained economic layer to all of this, right? So that you can literally pay people a little bit of money for providing their data and, and oh, have yeah. very fine grained mechanisms for improving. And I think that's, 
maybe theoretically possible for a centralized company to do, but uh, much harder. And, and I just don't think it's naturally how, like with blockchain, you have to build it like that, right? Like this is how it's going to work. With a centralized company, it may be possible to try to build it like that, but it's not the natural way it would be built. And, and thus, I don't think it's, it's going to happen in that context. Yeah, no, I, I agree. So let's let's drill down into what open mind is, right? Like so so what is it? Is is it a protocol? Is it a system? Like describe to us the constituent parts of it. Um so the it's an ecosystem and it's a community. Um so so I I am the first to say that that the most valuable piece of open mind is the 2000 people that are in a Slack team. Um, and like this, this uh, next weekend, there's going to be a hackathon where there are people in 21 different cities that actually go to a cafe and meet together. Right. That that's the part that really matters. It's the awareness um, and and making these tools accessible. But like so, but you're asking about the software. So, so um, the the actual software itself is an ecosystem of of libraries. The the main one, if you go to our, our GitHub repository, you'll see is actually a Unity engine or your Unity. Uh, I hate to use the word video game, but it's it's a, a, a piece of software that's packaged inside of the Unity game engine, um, and and what that is, and we'll just call that a, a mine, right? And and that is that is a piece of software that is designed to hold an individual's data and protect it, while allowing them to to be able to train machine learning models. So so. Um, when when delivered, uh, you should be able to go to the the kind of the Xbox gaming store and download a video game, um, and have clear instructions on your television or on your your phone or wh wherever you're downloading it to, um, to to load in your personal data, um, and on, on your behalf, it will earn earn a passive income stream, um, and it, it's responsible for downloading models from the blockchain, uh, training them locally, and sending updates to that model back out to the blockchain. Um, so from a, if you're picturing it in your head, it's kind of this, this sort of graph, right? Where at the middle sits, sits the blockchain and all these edges go out to individuals, um, who then, uh, with their private data, send gradients back up to, to, to the head node, um, which are then distributed back to whoever's training the model. Technically, what are the pieces? Like, what are the different technologies that you're, that you're using for it? Yeah. So, um, there is a, a deep learning library called SIFT. Um, and the reason we call it sift is it's like sifting through sand where you're, you're keeping the intelligence that you want, but you're leaving the, the data behind. Um, and then there's a, a blockchain smart contract piece. It's called Sonar, um, which is inspired by Sonar, which is your ability to glean information about something far away without, without actually having access to it. Um, and uh, packaged inside of sift is also um, the kind of the encryption pieces. So um, that's actually, it's a part of SIS. So it's an, a homomorphically encrypted and multi-party encrypted uh, uh, deep learning library. Um, so you can think of it, it's structured a lot like PyTorch uh, or Keras. And actually we have uh, interfaces now where if, so Py, PyTorch and Keras, if you're not familiar uh, and you're watching this, those are the, the, the main, uh, two of the main deep learning frameworks out there is also TensorFlow. Um, and um, uh, our the way that we're, we're setting up our SIFT library is that if you use PyTorch or Keras, you have an interface that is indistinguishable. So so that's like a deep learning library that has the exact down to the method calls. It's exactly the same, but um, it can be attached to very large private data repositories in the back end. Um, so yeah, deep learning library, smart contracts uh, system. Um, and I guess the only other piece that's worth mentioning is um, a piece that we, we haven't yet released it yet, but this is kind of be the uh, coming out in the next few weeks is a, a open grid. Um, which is basically the distributed uh, compute network that this will train on. So if, if you want to use kind of the GPU that's sitting in your, your game console, uh, your PlayStation or your Xbox, or you have some other NVIDIA GPU or something like that, and you want to earn an income passively by training deep learning models, uh, you'll be able to do so. Um, and, and the whole network will sort of sit on top of that compute layer. But the, the monetization, I mean, let's say now I want to do that. I want to provide my computational capacity to this network to contribute to better models or give my data or something like that. The, there's no monetization built into the software yet, right? There's no token to pay people or do you see that as kind of a layer that would be developed on top? Or do you see that different people would develop different approaches to solving this problem on top of these basic set of tools that you guys are developing? 
perhaps. Uh, the the interesting thing is that we're trying to build technology that allows a marketplace to happen. Um, and if you want to have a healthy marketplace, it's a lot easier if anyone can bring their own currency, right? Um, so so we've been kind of attached to this idea that that people should be able to trade with whatever they want to trade with. Um, tokenization for us, um, it looks a little bit more interesting when you look at shared ownership of the model afterwards. Like that's that's kind of interesting. But even then, that ownership is actually enforced through the cryptography, like the multi-party computation shares, uh, as opposed to a, a discrete token. So like tokenization, it's it's a lot, it's it's a much more difficult conversation in this sense because um, first off, whatever we build has to be not just useful, but also um, more accessible than the next best thing, right? We're all about making making private computation, federated learning as accessible as possible. And so when we look at a token model, it's like, okay, we could allow anyone to take to bring in any token that they want, right? Or we could add an artificial barrier to entry by having our own. So like that, that isn't, we're still e evaluating that. Um, but the, the, the consensus right now is that, that we want to make software so that you can show up. And if, if you want to you know, hook it up to your your Ethereum account or or on Cosmos. You know, if you want to use use Atoms or, or something like that, like it, you should be able to trade with whatever you want to trade with. Does that make sense? Um, yeah. Uh, and so, are you guys then building a kind of decentralized exchange where you can allow the, the this marketplace to occur? Or what kind of infrastructure are you building to you know for that actual marketplace and those actual economic transactions? Yeah. So that that's. The software that could support um, that kind of a marketplace or an exchange is is what we're what we're most concerned with, um, and actually do, making that exchange occur efficiently is like the that's the main problem that we work on day to day. It's it's all about okay if you have a data set and I have a model and I send you a model and you're sending me incremental updates, how do we as efficiently as possible without without um, you know executing too many transactions and losing money on gas or or uh, without doing the cryptography wrong and then making the gradient aggregation process really, really expensive for, you know, homework encryption and multi-party computation being inherently expensive algorithms. Like th the main problem that we focus on is making that, that exchange of value as efficient as possible. Um, which is honestly a very academic pursuit like that, that, and, and that's kind of the main theme. If you, if you hang out in the Slack team, you'll, you'll hear us talking about that most of the time. So the, so the basic idea, is, is obviously like, so you want to build a model and there's a hundred, hundred of us, right? Brian and me are two of them who have data that's relevant to train your model. So you send us the model. Um, I, I train the model on my side that ship the update. Then Brian downloads the updated model, trains that model, ships the update. Then person number 37, downloads the model, trains the model, ships the update. And yeah. slowly as we keep training the model, each each of us individually on our side, the model keeps getting better and better. And we are all compensated for basically training the model uh, in in Ether or Atoms or whatever the, the currency underlying the system. So this this can be this can be a, the compensation mechanism can be like a blockchain token, like a standard token. Right? Yeah. Or, or a stable coin, um, because like, like the biggest threat of a token for us is that the volatility is so much that no one actually wants to use the marketplace that we build for what we built it for, right? Um, I mean, I, I was extremely excited that one of the ways you introduced the project a few minutes ago was like one of the first projects that's trying to do something real and new with with the blockchain. Like, like our community cares a lot about this thing being used for exactly what we built it for, and and for you to like put your 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 bounty for training a machine learning model on the blockchain and for it to go up and down in value 10% per day is unacceptable right that's just it it's a, no one's going to train a million dollar healthcare model that way um, it's just we need this to be used by real people trying to create real value and and so like if if some like if someone comes along and solves the stablecoin issue or or you know one of those other innovations like it's it's not within our scope but we we don't have time resources to, to try to play federal reserve with our own own cryptocurrency to create that kind of stable market like we we um we kind of we kind of need that to be solved elsewhere to be honest um but but that's that's sort of that's where we're coming from and, and i know most other projects are like ico first and write software later and we're, we're totally inverted uh from that standpoint to the extent that that we have we've raised no funding 
Um, uh, and but we're still, you know, 110 people have contributed code, and 2,000 people are in the Slack, and and you know, our hackathon next week will, will be all over the world, and like people are really, really engaged and involved. Um, but that's that's sort of we really want it to be used for what we're building it for, um, and that's kind of how we've set up our priorities. One thing that I don't understand is um, in 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 all of these blockchain systems, how to partition a resource into multiple different agents for a service they deliver is is an outstanding problem. Like, so if you look at Bitcoin, um, there's a bunch of miners. Each of them is an economically distinct entity. And then you have the reward, which is like the block reward. And you want to distribute this block reward into these ent entities in some proportion of uh, the value contributed to them, right? So in, in, in the case of Bitcoin, that is, that is, turns out that's pretty easy. Like you can measure the amount of work contributed by each of these miners, and therefore you can partition this reward pretty efficiently. Now in your case, um, you have the central company that wants to train a model. And it has it wants to distribute a reward to all of these different agents in order to get the model trained. And then you have these different agents, like me, Brian, that uh, will contribute to training this this model. And our contributions might have different value to the company, right? So maybe when the model is entirely new, my data set might be very similar to Brian's, but I trained it first. So that first bit of training is very useful. But then a hundred other people trained it, and Brian was the hundred and first. And Brian's training is less valuable. So, uh, how do you decide how much to give to each agent that trained? Yeah. So um, we're super excited about our solution to this problem. Um, and uh, the way that we look at it is is directly inspired from machine learning research. So whenever you're going to go to train a model, the way that you objectively evaluate um, how accurate it is is using a validation set. Um, that's also the best way to specify what kind of model you want to be trained, right? If I just say a sentiment model, I could mean, like I, we talked beforehand, like I could mean a, a sentiment model for hospital patients, or I could mean a sentiment model for movie reviews, or I could mean a sentiment model for, for product reviews, and like all these things like they're domain specific, right? So the best possible way for someone to specify, hey, I want a model that knows how to do this is to provide uh, a small validation data set. Um, that also gives us the ability to objectively evaluate how valuable each gradient is or each set of gradients is um, to the incremental increase in intelligence of that model. Um, so, so the most expensive version you could think of like this, you send in a gradient, we update the model, Run, run the validation set over that model, uh, and now we see that it's 1% smarter, right? Or it's it's 1% closer to the target goal, and thus 1% of the bounty is allocated to you. Um, now, well, obviously, what we're working on are efficient approximations of this so that you don't have to run the validation set after every gradient, right? Um, um, and that's what a lot of our innovation is based on. Um, but but at, as a sort of high-level starting point, that's what it that's what's more or less based on. So incremental increases in the intelligence as measured by a validation data set allow me to know, up oh, his data's crap, up oh, his data's really good, I'm gonna pay him more, right? Without me ever actually seeing the data. Um, the, the other piece you mentioned uh, about showing up earlier or showing up later, um, uh, is solved using just a slightly different trick. So on the one hand, we actually do want to incentivize people to be first because that's what helps makes the model get trained fast enough. But um, uh, because these models tend to follow a pretty, um, you know, it's a it's a downward uh, sloping curve, right? You can you can sort of kind of adjust just using a, a function um, that that offsets sort of you know the first fifty percent receives this much bounty, the next thirty percent receives this much bounty, the next ten percent receives this bounty, and you can do that in a continuous way, um, so that you can control how much you want to incentivize the first guy, um, because anyone who's trained a machine learning model knows the last five percent is where you spend most of your work. <laughs> okay, so so you can kind of adjust it, and you can basically kind of overpay the later improvements. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And that's something that you guys would decide, or would that each uh, each each person submitting a model can decide that. So uh, okay. So okay. Cool. depending on how much yeah. they care, like if they if they just really need a model right now and they want it to train really quickly, well then then I imagine they would skew their uh, their rewards more towards the beginning of training. But if they're looking for the state of the art model, um, then they would they would 
reward heavily for the last mile, right? And they would really try to get everyone to eke out that last 1% um, and incentivize them to participate. So this sort of assumes that um, there is a validation data set, which is, let's say, let's say the model is to, is to predict, let's repeat that Fitbit example. You have my heart rate during the day and using that heart rate or whatever bi biological data, you're going to predict how well I'm going to sleep in the night, right? Mm -hmm. Or um, something like that. Yeah. So if you want to make a model like that, then you need to have a data set um, that is like very carefully curated. Like it's it's a set of observations that you have collected in the field that, hey, when people have had this heart rate during the day, they did sleep well this, this much percentage of the time. And that highly curated data set becomes your validation set. And then every time somebody ships an update to the model, you're going to um, use that curated data set you have, run it across the new model that comes and like measure the sort of performance of that model really well, right? Yep. So is it possible that a process like this can be attacked by creating some kind of biases that you aren't optimizing for? Like, for example, like you're training your model to be very good at recognizing X, yeah. but I am the person that is training your model. You don't know me because that's the that's the advantage of the system. You don't know who I am. You don't know, know my data, but I'm training your model. Can I like, can I force some kind of biases to emerge in your model mm -hmm. such that those biases are not obvious because they're not yeah, obvious. Yeah. You did end up paying me, but actually I've done a disservice to a model because I have introduce let's say some kind of racial bias like maybe maybe the bias might be that i don't know some for some kind of some kind of particular race uh, their heart rates and their sleep patterns are coded in a particular way but that's not true across other groups and i as a trainer of that data present more and more data for one particular racial category to the detriment that your model performs really well for that one category, but then there are other categories where it just doesn't. And yeah, I'm doing that yeah. in order to screw with your model, basically. Few things. First, this is a, a an active high priority in the machine learning community, period, right? I mean, this is this is something that the machine learning community is actively talking about. It's, it's on Twitter, it's at conferences, it's all over the place. Like, how do we have unbiased models? Um, on the one hand, our system, might add a little extra difficulty to that because you can't see the data. But on, on the other hand, um, the because it's a free market for gradients, um, we, we, uh, we've got some really good defenses against it um, because there's such a wide variety of sources. So even if, even if one guy showed up with a data set that was skewed, the, uh, unless he's responsible for the vast majority of the data, um, there's going to be other people that are creating a more robust distribution, right? So, so it's a lot easier to to accidentally have bias if you're pulling data just from one distribution. But if you're if you're opening up the accessibility and 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 making it possible to pull from lots of diff different distributions, it becomes a lot more difficult to to hijack the model. Um, now, that all being said, um, um, what are we doing to help to help mitigate this this particular problem? Um, so the first one is is not all gradients get accepted. It's actually only gradients that contribute to the, in the current the current plan for how we roll up. Um, it's only gradients that that contribute to what ends up being the highest quality model. So um, the that creates an added challenge for someone trying to add bias to the system because they they don't need to just contribute gradients that are marginally good but also include their bias. They have to contribute gradients that end up participating in the highest model, right? So if you could think about having multiple different models that are being trained and only the top one will actually get, you know, pushed out to to the ecosystem, um, it, it has to know which one to pick. And, and, and it also has to, when it when it creates a, so it creates like GitHub forks. So if you're familiar with, with GitHub, you know, you create a code repository and then there's a fork off and there's a little bit of improvement and then a fork off and a little bit of improvement. Um, that's sort of how these models end up getting trained. Um, so it becomes significantly more difficult. It's not just like one model and all the gradients aggregated and you just get paid for however your contributions. 
even if you have good data, you have to you have to participate in the best model to get included at all. Um, and your level of participation is going to be regulated based on how 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 much accuracy you add to the model. So there's there's um, there's already some very significant hurdles that you have to cross, and it's even more difficult in the open mind ecosystem because we have such a wide distribution of data. Um, so whereas you can you can provide your your piece of it, um, unless unless you can convince the system that that you should be um, um, you should you should be the dominant amount of gradients, which you can only do if you're also contributing good data. It becomes very difficult. So, so um, this is still an active research question. It's an extremely high priority in the machine learning uh, community. Um, but we like to think that we sit at a pretty strong advantage by allowing data to come from multiple different sources and by not just not allowing any gradients, but only gradients that contribute to the best model. Cool. So, what's the current state of the Open Mind project? Uh, like, how far have you gotten? What are the main things coming up? Yeah, so um, we opened our GitHub repositories in July of last year. So we're almost six months old. Um, uh, the We launched our first smart contract on a test chain in, I think it was November, um, that you could do basic federated learning with. Um, and uh, I guess in the last six months, about uh, our community has grown to about 110 uh, code contributors and about 2,000 people on our, on our Slack channel. Um, the next thing to be released here in the next few months are so we, we just finished our our kind of initial deep learning library um, interfaces for PyTorch for Keras um, and our standard Autograd system. So basically, you can do um, you can chain together any sequence of kind of machine learning computations, and it will automatically backpropagate and update. So the deep learning library is more or less in in alpha. Um, um, we we do have a blockchain or a smart contract up on the blockchain. Uh, that being said, we're working hard on performance improvement. So I wouldn't necessarily say that that was ready for for kind of general availability or prime time. It's on a test chain. Um, um, the thing that we're working most hard on now is, and the next thing that we're going to end up being uh, end up releasing is the the compute grid. So this whole system has to live on a, a pretty significant amount of compute in order to do distributed machine learning. Uh, and so we're, we're looking to release that part in alpha uh, in the next few months, um, next two, two to three, two to three months. Uh, we'll, we'll have it internally before then. You said you guys have uh, something running on a test chain. So is it, in the end the idea that you guys will run your own blockchain or do you guys have a like run on top of another blockchain or do you guys have a, a, an idea of what direction that is going to go in? Yeah, we're, we've got a short list. So the short list is Ethereum, uh, Tendermint, um, and, uh, and then this really cool project called Trillion. Um, and it, it might end up being a combination of several. Once again, like we're trying to make this as accessible as possible for us. Just being on one chain might, might not be really enough. Uh, uh, we've also been approached by lots of enterprises who are interested in doing this on kind of their big data data warehouses, which I actually view as even though we're very excited about consumer data, if if enterprises want to be able to protect their data and not send it around as much, but still extract the same value from it, I think that that's pretty awesome. Uh, the answer is we'll probably do multiple, um, and and hopefully once again, like I, I really my hope is that Open Mind will be referred to like open source. It's it's a, a more a community and a class of algorithms than any one particular chain or one particular uh, um, one particular protocol. I've been a quiet onlooker onto your Slack community, and uh, it's it's a huge community. I actually lo love the way you manage the community. Like every day, you are like commending members of your community for doing something. I I, I get the impression you are a great manager, although I haven't. Uh, ever worked with open mind or whatever um and you have this hackathon coming along like tell us some of what are the interesting projects that are being done in your community like actual applications that people are building mm. um so unfortunately the most interesting ones are being done by people who kind of want to keep it to themselves for the moment so i won't i won't spoil their surprise um uh, I think that the most interesting one that's public um, is uh, based on reinforcement learning. So the uh, Unity machine learning team reached out a few weeks ago, and they, um, they've they been particularly excited about us building a deep learning engine that actually sits inside of Unity. Um, 
And uh, um, so they actually commented on on uh, one of our GitHub issues you'll find, and I'll just I'll share what's what's what they said, um, which is more or less we want to build. They've got this really cool project called ML Agents. You might have seen it is in the top of Hacker News not too long ago, um, and it's basically the ability to train TensorFlow-based machine learning agents inside of Unity worlds. So like you can create a world inside of Unity um, that an agent can interact with. You know, it might be balancing something or it might be running. You've probably seen some of the GIFs uh, running around. Um, and um, so Unity has been working on their own project for that. Um, but in order to do that, they they have had to, and to get it to work with TensorFlow, they, they literally render an image inside of Unity and then shoot it out via a socket to TensorFlow, which then makes a prediction. And then they take the prediction and shoot it back into Unity and then iterate the game to the next frame. Um, and this and they're not unique in the way they do this. Everyone who does reinforcement learning kind of does it this way, right? There's sort of one rendering engine that sits over here, and then there's whatever deep learning engine, PyTorch, Keras, whatever is sitting, sitting over here. Um, so I think the most interesting project that's happening right now is the potential for the machine learning engine to live inside of the world that and on the same GPUs in the same namespace as as the uh, the RL worlds exist, right? Because then then you can do all sorts of crazy stuff. I mean, you can use machine learning models to help with the rendering process or to to make the world different, right? You could have so one AI that makes the world and the other AI that runs around in it, right? I mean, you can do all sorts of crazy stuff, and also you get better latency and better performance, which allows you to do new stuff. So I think the one of the most interesting projects is going on in the community is is um, rebuilding a lot of their reinforcement learning demos, but with our deep learning engine based in the Unity game engine actually being used as, as the back end. Um, uh, and there, there's some really cool demos. Like I highly recommend checking it out. Um, those Unity guys, they really know how to make, uh, well, they know how to make Unity look really good. So they know how to build really cool games. <laughs> cool. Well, um, so if people want to get involved in Open Mind or learn more about it, what's the best, what should they check out, check out and how can they you know, participate? Yeah, um, so join the Slack. Um, and say hi in general discussion. Um, there's a quick start guide uh, that walks you through like like who we are, what we do, what the community is about, what we're trying to build. Um, we've got around 200 GitHub issues that are labeled good first issue. And what those are designed to be, are they supposed to be like the first code contribution that you make. Um, so it, each issue actually has a tutorial on like how to set up your dev environment, how to get Unity installed, like maybe you've never built a video game before and like how to actually implement the piece of functionality that you're trying to implement. So it's, it's literally a tutorial for how to contribute code to the system. Um, we try to make that barrier really low. Um, and once you actually have your first merge pull request, you become an official contributor on OpenMind. And you, um, your face appears on our homepage, and you, um, you are a member of our GitHub organization. And that's sort of like the, the formal process for, for becoming kind of a member uh, of the GitHub org. Um, so yeah, come hang out. It's super fun. Um, and, uh, we're in, we've got this really cool team map, um, uh, which I can send you the link for, uh, and it's, it's actually, it's my Twitter cover photo as well. Um, that has basically every person all over the world with a little dot, um, uh, showing where everyone lives. And it's like, it's in every time zone. So when you go, when you go hang out, not every time zone, but almost like a lot of time zones. Um, when, so when you hang out in Slack, there's, there's always someone online to talk to, uh, and work on really cool stuff with. And you mentioned that you guys are organizing some kind of like hackathon. When is that happening? Yeah, uh, a week from Saturday. So um, we, we have hackathons all the time. Um, um, we usually have them on Saturdays or Sundays. Um, and there there's usually a, a in-person component and also a virtual component. So we'll have a Google Hangout that'll have lots of people in it. Um, but this this on Saturday the 13th, we're going to have a hackathon, and I believe there's going to be 21 physical locations in 21 different cities around the world. So there's there's probably one near you. There's like a Florida, Toronto, California, Turkey, uh, uh, Austria, uh, yeah, uh, London, obviously, because I'll be there. Um, but yeah, so so come to the hackathon, and if you can't come in person, come come hang in the hangout, and we'll get to know each other. Cool. Well, uh, Andrew, thanks so much. It was a pleasure uh, learning about this super awesome project. And uh, I, I do agree with Mayer, even though I don't have as deep an insight that you seem to be, uh, this seems to be a very vibrant and well-run and uh, growing community. So I, I hope I'm going to see lots of uh, exciting news coming out of this project. <laughs> me too. <laughs> thanks for having me. So thanks so much, Andrew. And, and of course, uh, thanks so much for our listener for once again uh, tuning in. 
If you want to support the show, you can do so by leaving us an iTunes review or sending us a tape as well. And otherwise, we look forward to being back next week. Thanks so much, and we'll see you then.